My name is Rowan Mera. I currently work at the University of Tokyo's Public Relations Group. And the theme of this presentation is Form and Narrative in Documentary Film. Um, I'll begin by talking about what we mean by documentary film. So um, I guess everyone is very familiar with written content. You know, we don't need to explain what a word is, a paragraph, etc. We don't need to explain a quote and those kinds of things. With something like film, I feel it's important to lay down some groundwork because I think a lot of people have perhaps um, preconceptions about what different things in film language might mean. Um, so I'm going to start by going into background of documentary film, the different types of them and the common elements that comprise them. Um, and then I'll advise on how to apply this knowledge to build narratives about research and also about practical considerations in going about this. Um, so as, uh, as you had said in his introduction, I assume the reason I've been asked to give this presentation is that most of my career has involved either research communication of some kind or media production, or in some ways, both of them. Um, and so, yeah, I've worked for television companies, magazines, museums, and a few other bits and pieces. Um, certainly in the UK, and maybe other places as well. Science communication is one of those brilliantly amorphous fields where a lot of people tend to have worked in a lot of different ways. Um, what I particularly like about film in particular is that it sort of builds on a lot of these different skills that you pick up in different areas. Um, so for example, if you're very good at public speaking, there's going to be something in the world of film for you to do. If you're very good at art and those kind of abstract creative uh, decisions and things, there's going to be some kind of production role for you. If you're very good at writing, there's script writing and so on and so on. Um, so for that reason, it's a world I strongly encourage people to explore. Um, and of course, following this presentation, um, always feel free to email me, I'm happy to speak with anyone in or around my field. Um, so let's jump into it. Um, so great question to begin with. What is documentary? What do we actually mean by documentary? It's um, it's a genre of film. And as with other genres of film, uh, it's not necessarily a very, very rigidly defined thing. A lot of films will fit a certain genre very well, but there's always going to be different elements of other genres in those films. This is perhaps more easily explained with music, where whenever you try and call a piece of music a certain genre, you're going to find elements of some other genre within it. Um, now, um, from teaching this subject for many years, I've come to realise that most people do instinctively know when a piece of visual media is or is not a documentary, but they might sometimes have a hard time describing exactly why. Like with a lot of films, you can kind of pretty much from certain aesthetic clues figure out what it is if you haven't been told in advance. For example, um, you know, if it's a science fiction or fantasy, it's going to have some fantastical element in it. If it's going to be a musical, it's going to have music in it. Um, action will have obviously some, you know, fast paced visual action, those kinds of things. Whereas documentary, it certainly has things that trigger, you know, the, the, the sight, sense that it is a documentary. Um, but there is quite a range of documentaries and not all of them will feature the same kinds of visual cues or audio cues. Um, so a lot it's tempting to think of a documentary as simply something that deals with reality. And for the most part, this is true. But there are plenty of fiction films either based in or grounded on reality. So an example of uh, the former would be something like a biopic about somebody famous. So, for example, um, a film I have a bit of a connection with, the uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, the biopic of Queen. Um, I was lucky enough to meet the Queen's official biographer um, on the set of that film. And uh, he was having a bittersweet time because on the one hand, this is his dream come true. You know, his life's work of documenting the lives of the members of Queen was being made as a big budget film. But they took a lot of creative license with his work and with the real lives of the band. In fact, a lot of the elements in that film are complete fiction, despite the fact that the film is based on reality. Um, and an example of the latter, so that's things that might be grounded in reality. Something could be like a soap opera, which is extremely real. You know, it's normal people living normal lives, eating normal breakfast cereal you can buy in your normal kombini. But it's fiction. Okay. 
So um, when thinking about documentary, don't worry so much about this definition that it's got to be real. It's something almost everybody I teach documentary film says when I first ask this question, what is documentary? They'll put their hands up and say, ah, sensei, it's something that's real. And then, you know, I, as all good teachers, destroy their reality. Um, and just as a side note, there are also uh, a bit of a small genre called mockumentary, uh, which really muddies the waters. It's not a major concern, but it's fun to know about. And that is um, mockumentary is a basically a, a mock documentary. It's a film about made up things, which is using the language of documentary that we're instinctively familiar with to present itself as something real. Um, a relatively recent example of this I'd recommend is a film called What We Do in the Shadows, which is about vampires living in urban New Zealand. And I, I forget if it's Wellington or some city, but they um, it's a comedy and it's a great film, but it's presented like a documentary. So, you know, a camera crew running around interviewing people and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah, instead of worrying about reality, um, we like to describe a documentary as something that follows one or more of the following forms. Scroll down and. So within documentary, uh, we have these things called forms. Um, there might be other ways of explaining them. Certainly the books I was taught, um, we called it forms, um, but they're effectively sub genres of documentary. Um, and as with major genres, these are not mutually exclusive things. These are ways of presenting narratives that are um, uh, completely non-exclusive. Okay, so th there might be a way of doing something that is primarily one of these, but incorporates elements of others. Um, so the one we're most likely to find relevant to our own work as people who make films about research is this one over here, expository. So an expository documentary is kind of like a story essay. It typically has one point of view or one voice. And as such, it might have a voiceover or a specific narrator. Um, and it will incorporate things like archive imagery quite heavily. Um, it's probably the most common form of documentary and perhaps what most people imagine when they think about documentaries. Um, so a, a typical expository documentary might be something like, you know, the David Attenborough type shows. So there's a there's a lion in the Serengeti and David Attenborough is saying, you know, here's the lion. The lion is fed up. It's about to go and eat somebody um, or something. And um, it's expository because these decisions about what to say and what to shoot have um, probably been made in advance. And it's it's usually not reacting to something that's unfolding as the film is being made. There's exceptions, but that's generally uh, the idea behind an expository film. It's an essay that has been scripted prior to execution. OK, um, another couple of types of documentary are things like observational. So this is a fly on the wall type documentary. So um, a lot of reality shows kind of pretend to be this, like a fly on the wall. No one is really interacting with the thing that's happening in front of the camera. Um, of course, in reality, a lot of these kinds of things are quite fake in some ways they have to be. But the idea is that you're giving someone a sort of almost unedited window into a world they would not otherwise have access to. Um, another kind might be participatory. So this is where a presenter is involved with the story and usually drives it forward through interacting with people. Um, but the subject matter itself is usually independent of the participants in question. Um, so there's a lot of quite famous documentary filmmakers. Um, I'm sure some of you may have heard of Michael Moore, uh, who made Bowling for Columbine um, and a lot of other films. So he might be an example of a participatory filmmaker. Um, or M uh, Morgan Spurlock, who made a documentary about fast food and other things like this. And he tends to get involved with the film a little bit. Um, 
one of uh, a genre that's quite close to my heart, but I rarely have chance to really make anything like this is a poetic documentary. Um, so uh, this is a form that creates a narrative through interpretation. And so the audience is expected to kind of work a little bit with this one. It's less about things being explained to you and more about things being shown to you that you can then construct yourself. Um, these are usually quite striking, usually quite heavy in mood and tone. Um, and obviously it's called poetic because it's not so literal, okay? This is far more, um, far more abstract. So uh, I'll follow up with a document that has examples of all of these things. Um, and uh, another type I kind of like to highlight is uh, reflexive. It overlaps heavily with participatory, but the idea of reflexive film is one where the film itself kind of is the story. Um, think of these as sort of behind the scenes films. Um, Again, I'll follow up with examples because it's uh, it gets a little bit blurry as to what reflexive might be and participatory isn't. Um, examples make it much more clear. Um, but the idea is that um, if something has one of these forms, very obviously, you can probably safely call it a documentary. That said, a lot of fiction films do now incorporate documentary elements. Um, I'm sure you've all seen you know, some of the Marvel films or something like that in a lot of them now, they have these little bits where it's almost as if people um, observing something um, upload something to YouTube, like a lot of films like to include YouTube things. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've, I've seen it in a lot of films um, and it's sort of a, a, an, a, an attempt to be um, to insert the language of documentary into mainstream narrative cinema. Um, but anyway, these forms can be narrative devices, okay? That is, they can help shape your narrative, but they are not narrative structures in themselves, okay? Um, so uh, typically documentaries uh, will share a lot of different kinds of um, components, different audiovisual materials. Um, and uh, I like to call this a filmmaker's toolkit. So if the forms of a documentary are the subgenre. The components of a documentary are like the instruments being played or perhaps like the colors in an artist's palette, okay? Um, these components are not unique to documentaries, but in, if you see some of these juxtaposed together, included together, um, it usually signals that a film is a documentary. Um, some of these elements will need to be created by filmmakers and some will already exist prior to the film. Uh, for example, researchers may have photos or videos of their research. A stock video website might have some videos that can add some social context when you're talking about research. And uh, you might need to shoot additional materials such as interviews or record some narration or those kinds of things. Music if you're feeling really frivolous. Um, and the goal of a documentary filmmaker is to use these tools to tell your stories. Um, as Ruth said, um, these can, some of these things can serve as hooks. So, you know, uh, like, I, I quite liked the laptop example, you know, they, they don't, of, of course you can find the information about the memory, but the idea is the laptop is sold based on what you do with it. Um, and analogously perhaps, um, some of these things can show you some kind of context or application before or as well as dealing with the scientific content or research content itself. Um, so uh, good filmmakers tend to show rather than tell where possible. Um, and you know, if the element, if an element of story can be shown with some kind of visual demonstration or analogy, it's more likely to stick with people than if somebody just explains the thing in question. And for this reason, it's nice to try and include quite a spread of these different kinds of things, um, because there'll be different elements of your story where one of these, one or more of these components is particularly useful. So actions, especially for the kinds of things we're likely to make. Um, it lends itself very well to science, you know, um, again, this kind of image of somebody doing something, um, a picture tells a thousand words, right? So if you can find um, or create images of somebody performing an action, it's going to mean a lot more than that person just explaining the action. They do work very well together, though. 
Um, so with clever planning and editing, it is very common to use both. Show what you're explaining and explain what you're showing. OK, um, in any case, um, ideally, filmmakers want to create a story that provokes an emotional response in the audience. Uh, be it fascination, frustration, hope, whatever, whatever it is they're trying to um, provoke in their audience, whatever they're trying to get across. Um, now, as people who are likely to make research films, probably the most key component for our sorts of films is likely to be interview um, and perhaps narration as well, as these are very key for creating the expository uh, form, the expository mode of film. Okay. Um, and um, also, um, as Ruth explained so nicely, um, people engage with stories more than facts. So, you know, using a mixture of these helps us get away from those films that I see all too often that are effectively just lectures filmed. Um, these can help bring something more to life. OK. So in contrast to documentary, fiction films are often called narrative films or narrative cinema. Um, and this sounds like it would imply that documentaries don't have narratives, but this is it doesn't imply that at all. Um, after all, documentaries feature people, people telling stories, either on camera or off camera. And of course, stories build narratives. What separates documentary narratives from written ones is, I guess, that beyond words, uh, filmmakers have all of these tools at their disposal. Um, and as well as that, um, films are very limited to being a linear mode of communication. So um, with uh, obviously with viewing things on the Internet, people can skip around, but it is expected that an audience will sit and watch a film from start to finish. And for this reason, I think a lot of people uh, starting out try and tell very linear narratives based on this sort of, you know, those typical three act structures of starting beginning, middle and end, trying to tell a kind of chronological story. And there's no problem with this. It's a, a tried and tested way of, of telling a story. And it actually does work very nicely for a lot of research stories. Um, but it's not the only way of telling uh, a, a research story in a three act structure. Um, for example, it can be any chain of thematically or topically connected mm -hmm. elements. So of course you have past, present, future, but there's no reason you couldn't flip that and have future, present, past. Um, it could be one of uh, the, the narrative could have something more to do with scale. You could begin by talking about fundamentals. What is an atom? Applications. What is nuclear power? And then implications. What nuclear power could mean to the world? Um, or, I mean, I'm sure there's some more modern examples than that, um, but something like that. Um, or, the pro or the story could be the problem, but from different perspectives. So perhaps different researchers working on the same problem, but coming at it from different ways, contrasting viewpoints about social issues, those kinds of things. Um, so again, can break away from past, present, future. Um, or it could be something more like um, questions around the research. So perhaps a broad idea followed by how this idea is executed, followed by why this idea is executed. There's no need to stick to very um, linear structures just because a film is a linear structure. OK, um, so let's talk about how to actually execute these things. Like what are some practical considerations to uh, building narratives in a film? Um, perhaps the biggest pra practical consideration uh, one that's very unsurprising, in fact, um, is that uh, to craft anything, you need time. Um, when you're filming a lecture, you don't need a lot of time to plan it. Of course, it's good if you have time to plan something, always use it. Um, but a, a straight up lecture uh, doesn't need a lot of time for planning. The more time you have to prepare, the more thorough you can be and uh, the, you know, the more time you can spend on thinking around the content of the film and thinking around the, the, the subject matter and what's going to be said, and instead think about how it's going to be said on how you can tell it as a story rather than a bunch of facts. Um, so I've got up here the uh, life cycle of a film. 
And uh, this it shouldn't be anything too surprising. This is how many uh, projects, certainly creative projects, uh, will work, beginning with an idea, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but of course, every stage uh, can take time. And what I tend to find is um, a lot of people beginning uh, their starting out making films, they might either have an idea or be given an idea and might straight away go and shoot something without spending a lot of time planning something. Um, and I think this is especially true when I see a lot of um, films about research uh, from a lot of universities. Um, some of the films might have some very interesting content, but it's essentially just a pretty rehearsed uh, professor just talking to the camera. Um, and if you're into that thing, that's great. But does it help the audience? Remember that all communication must be very, very audience focused. And does it help the audience to just see a rehearsed piece to camera? Or would there be some better way of um, getting across what you want? Um, and of course, planning is key to this. Um, so um, working, you know, uh, um, working with participants, of course, requires time management as well. Um, it's common for people to assume that because a short film uh, that you're making might just be a few minutes, five minutes long, that you therefore only need five minutes of their time. Um, but in reality, it takes a lot longer to get good information out of people um, than just the runtime of the film. Um, I'd say it typically takes about one hour to get a good five minutes out of somebody. Um, that can surprise some people, I think. Um, and in an international environment such as ours, of course, language barriers may increase this as well. So it's just something to be very, very wary of. Basically, a lot of it just comes down to time. Um, speaking of which, my time is probably running out. Um, but with more time to dedicate it to the project, you'll have more time to carefully construct some kind of narrative rather than just have some kind of improvised lecture or something that won't be so entertaining. Um, and, um, you know, uh, if, if you can meet your participants in advance, you'll be able to learn about them and provide some kind of context and background to their research, which again helps build elements of stories that can help um, you know, bring something to life more than it could if you were just straight up filming them, giving their giving their lecture. Um, so, um, as with any communication, like I said, keep things audi audience focused. Um, not only in terms of the information content, making that relevant, but also in the way the information is conveyed. Um, remember that when we're using filmmaking techniques, um, not to just explain research. Um, but to provide context, sell the importance of the research. Um, films bring ideas to life, so let's do that with our own content, with our own participants, with our own professors. Um, any, uh, I'll follow up with a document that includes examples, because I think a lot of what I talked about is quite broad, um, and I think examples will really, really help pick out um, what is meant by certain things, especially some of the uh, components of the documentaries, some of the forms and so on. Um, I kept a lot of that stuff out to save time because uh, we've already um, expired that. Um, and of course, I'm very keen to hear from people, speak with people, advise or consult on filmmaking or training or related things, unofficially, of course. Um, but yeah, let's, um, uh, let's open up if anybody wants to ask me anything.